there's nothing more, there's nothing more exciting for the Hellenic University Club to introduce an accomplished intellectual scholar teacher who was a recipient of a Hellenic. So uh, Dr. Paul Postolivis is associate professor, professorial lecturer and deputy head of department for education in the government department of the London School of Economics and Political Science. He's the author of The Fight for Time, Migrant Day Laborers and the Politics of Precarity, Breaks in the Chain, What Immigrants Workers Can Teach America About Democracy, Stations of the Cross, Adorno and Christian Right Radio, as well as co-editor of Public Affairs, Politics in the Age of Sex Scandals. His research integrates empirical field research involving Latinx migrant workers in the United States with political and critical theory. He is currently a collaborator in the Mellon funded research project, Latinx Futures, the civil, cultural and political stakes for Southern California's Latinx communities, joining researchers from the US and Mexican universities in exploring the resources for democratic resurgence among Latinx civil society organizations in response to racial authoritarianism. He's also working on a project that theorizes precarious labor and social reproduction in the nighttime economy. As an education leader at the London School of Economics, he spearheads the school's new civic engagement and undergraduate research initiatives. But prior to joining the LSE's faculty in 2019, he taught for 22 years at Whitman College in Washington State where he held the T. Paul Endowed Chair of Political Science, founded a nationally recognized civil, civil, civically engaged undergraduate research program, and directed Whitman's first year liberal arts program. Dr. Apostolidis grew up in the Philadelphia area, earned his AB from Princeton University, and received his PhD and MA from Cornell University. So it's a great pleasure to introduce one of our members, uh, and I will pass the Zoom mic on to Dr. Apostolidis. Uh, and I also will ask you to keep your mics off. We will have questions and answers at the end of the talk, in which case we'll be able to turn our mics back on and, and have a, a nice conversation about uh, Dr. Apostolidis' talk. Okay. Thank you everyone for coming on a Saturday afternoon. And thank you, Paul, for Zooming in uh, five hours ahead from the, from, from England. Thanks, Kostis. Um, thanks for your introduction. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Um, I'm really honored to have the chance uh, to speak to you today because the Hellenic University Club has meant a great deal uh, to my family over many years. Uh, so I'm here um, as a scholar, uh, very grateful for the support that the Hellenic University Club gave me in my own college education. Uh, I'm here also because I take pride in the work done by my grandparents and their friends to launch the club many years ago. And I'm also here to honor my mother who passed away last year and who remained a proud HUC member until her final days. So about 20 years ago, I was beginning field work for a new research project about immigration work and political power in the meatpacking industry. I was a young professor at Whitman College, Whitman College, which is located in the town of Walla Walla in southeastern Washington state. Uh, I've been working at Whitman for several years after I finished my graduate degrees at Cornell in 1996. Initially, Walla Walla seemed impossibly remote to me, not just rural, but isolated and very far from cities where important political and cultural events were happening. Although I'd grown up in the suburbs, um, I knew that my family had had close uh, connections to the city of Philadelphia. I was aware that my parents had been married at St. George's Greek Orthodox Church in Center City by Archbishop Jacobus, in fact. Occasionally, my papu, Nicholas Pattis, and my yaya, Kibeli Pattis, would take my sister Marissa and me to Saturday lunch at the Philadelphia Art Alliance, where they were members. And papu also had worked for several years um, in uh, central Philadelphia, along with my uncle Angie, uh, at the original location of Lankanaw Hospital, where they were both physicians. The wide lawns and the private spaciousness of uh, Radnor Township, where I grew up, were more familiar to me as a child and a teenager. 
And I loved the way that Princeton felt like a world apart with its Gothic buildings amid towering trees and stately gardens. But Ithaca, New York, well, that felt like the hinterlands. And Walla Walla, Washington seemed like absolutely nowhere. To get to Seattle, um, my wife and I had to drive nearly 300 miles with our kids holding their noses and shouting in protest as we passed by reeking cattle feedlots, slaughterhouses, and dairy farms. You know, beef and dairy are big industries in Eastern Washington state, global industries, in fact. Um, in 2001, the Tyson Foods Company acquired IBP Inc. and became the world's largest producer of fresh beef, pork, and chicken. And beef from Tyson's plant, formerly IBP's, near Pasco, Washington, which is 30 miles west of Walla Walla, that beef ends up in McDonald's hamburgers all over the United States and in Asia and in Latin America. So thanks to Tyson, little old Pasco, Washington is thus an unlikely hub of the world food economy. And it became keenly interesting to me when I heard about some very unusual activities among the immigrant workers at Tyson. In 1999, the New York Times and the Washington Post reported that the largest wildcat or spontaneous uh, strike in recent US history had broken out at IVP's Pasco facility on one hot summer day. Fed up with horrifyingly dangerous working conditions and defying their own union's unresponsive leadership, nearly 1,500 workers stormed out of the factory. Somehow, having moved about as far away from East Coast city life and my Greek family's American roots as I could imagine, I'd ended up in the midst of major public events after all. And these events mattered to me as the child of an immigrant father and the grandson of immigrants on my mother's side. So in graduate school, I'd mainly been interested in religion and politics. And this was in tune with my family life in a different way. Papu was fascinated by Christian theology and religious history. Books on St. Luke, whom he loved because the evangelist was a physician, filled the shelves in his library at the house in Drexel Hill. As a founding member of St. Luke's in Brumal, Papu was given the key to the church and officially opened it with Yaya in 1963. Inspired by Papu, my mom spent a year at Union Theological Seminary. So I came by my interest in politics and religion honestly, you might say, and I wrote my dissertation, which became my first book on that subject. But something stirred inside me when I learned that virtually all the people who had challenged the lords of the meat industry at Tyson's Pasco plant were immigrants. I wondered, what did their experiences as immigrants have to do with their audacious actions as workers? We were an immigrant family too. Were our stories and histories as immigrants like theirs, even though we were Greek and they were mostly Mexican? Well, I decided to write a book about what motivated these downtrodden people to advocate for themselves under such demoralizing and hazardous conditions. I especially wanted to know how being immigrants had shaped what they did, thought, and felt. And I had a feeling that as someone from a Greek immigrant background, my experiences were connected to what these Mexican neighbors of ours were trying to achieve. So I began interviewing individual Tyson workers to gather their oral histories as primary material for my book. The people told us about growing up in rural or urban Mexico. They came from many different places in Mexico. They explained how they decided to leave for the US, usually coming from very poor families under difficult circumstances, and how it felt to leave behind people in places that they loved or didn't love so much. They described harrowing and sometimes life-threatening treks across the US-Mexico border. This was mostly even in the 1980s before the border became so massively militarized. They talked about working in the fields when they arrived, picking grapes, strawberries, apples, peaches, you name it, they picked it. They shared chilling stories of working at Tyson where they quickly realized that enduring constant bodily pain and routine humiliation were basic conditions of earning their wages. And they told us how they had emboldened one another to stand up for themselves when they were mistreated and eventually to take charge of their local union so that it could support those efforts. So one day my assistant and I interviewed a woman named Elvira Mendez at her kitchen table. Now she worked at Tyson IVP for a long time and she also had been a leader in the push for democratic reforms in the union. 
And as we talked about her memories of the past and struggles in the present at the kitchen table, now and then one of her grandkids would run in and out of the room. Elvira would pause and give out a cookie or dry someone's tears. When we were done, she insisted that we stay for a bowl of pozole. That's a Mexican stew that is thick with corn hominy and chicken, best enjoyed with a fresh lime squeeze and a sprinkle of dried oregano. Now, I had never tasted pozole or even heard of it before moving to Eastern Washington, where such a large part of the population is of Mexican descent, about 25% of the people in Walla Walla, 55% in Pasco. But there was something familiar to me about the grandmotherly ways of Elvira and the other older women whom we interviewed. Their ways with children, with food, that squeeze of lime, which kind of reminded me of the lemon my yaya always had on the table. But one day I was catching up with the union's leader, Maria Martinez, about our progress on the interviews. And I said, you know, I love these conversations because the workers remind me of people in my family. There must be some real similarities between Greek and Mexican immigrant experiences. Well, one of Maria's virtues as a leader, that's her in the middle, was her willingness to speak clearly and directly about controversial matters. She looked me right in the eye and without hesitating or smiling, she said, no, Paul, it's different. It's not the same. It's really different. Maria's words startled me. I kind of knew that I was taking a risk to make this comparison, but I wanted to share with her how the interviews weren't just an academic exercise for me. They felt more personal. And that seemed to come from the way family life expressed itself in familiar ways and in a language that wasn't English. Maria's brisk retort made me reconsider that idea. I realized I had naively assumed it to be easier than it actually was to identify with the workers and their struggle. And I knew that I needed to figure out for myself what was different about the paths trodden by Greek and Mexican immigrants, even when things felt so much alike. So what was our path as a family of Greek immigrants to the United States? Well, the central character in the story has always been my papu, Nicholas Pattis, or Nico, as Yaya used to call him. That's now the name of my son, by the way, and two of my cousins, although Papu was also known around Lankanaw and elsewhere as Nick. Now, Papu was born in Mitilini on Lesbos, according to an anecdote in a wonderful family cookbook that my cousin Poppy created. When Papu, quote, was a little boy, he drank his milk straight from their mother goat. He would just get under her and suckle. He grew up to be a doctor and certainly always looked well fed. Now here, Poppy makes it sound like it was really no big deal for Papu to go from being an island child whose family kept goats to a well-fed doctor. And yet a lot of hardship and loss and struggle intervened for this individual who began life in the village and eventually served as this club's co-founder and first president in 1936. Things changed very much for the worse for Papu and his parents and two sisters when violence escalated between Greeks and Turks around the time of World War I. The family had to flee Mytilene, and it was decided that Papu would travel all by himself to America, even though he was only 14 years old. How he did that and what that was like, I can only imagine. But somehow he made it to Boston, where it's always been said that he lied at the border in order to get himself into the United States. Evidently, Papu told the officials that he was 16, because US law prohibited individuals younger than that from entering the country alone. They let him in, presumably without documents, but they shortened his name from Badiatis to Pattis, I guess because they saw it as their prerogative to make his name sound better to their ears. Papu could be very persuasive. This is the same fellow who about 20 years later was determined to go see President Franklin Roosevelt speak at the 1936 Democratic National Convention in Philadelphia. Papu, I hear, presented himself at the door with no ticket, but plenty of bluster and gravitas and announced that he was the physician, Dr. Pattis. He was escorted to a front row seat, no further questions asked. Courage, audacity, tenacity. Those are the personal qualities that I've always heard associated with my grandfather and his immigration story and unrelenting hard work like countless other Greek immigrants. Papu started working two jobs in Boston, 
laboring by day in a tire factory and at nights as a waiter in a restaurant. In little time, and still as a teenager, he made enough money to pay for his parents and sisters to come join him in the United States. And he even saved enough to set up his own father with a small shoe repair business. A few years later, he was awarded a scholarship to attend Boston University, and then attended medical school and launched his career as a physician in Philadelphia, where he met my grandmother. I know nothing about the nature of my papu's voyage to the United States. I know though that when the rest of the family made the trip, things were dangerous. Resting on the mantle of our flat in London is a very important object that survived that perilous trip. It's our family icon. Painted several hundred years ago with gold leaf that shimmers in candlelight, the icon shows St. Simeon's joyful response when the baby Jesus is presented at the temple. Papu's parents were very worried about how to keep the icon safe from people who might steal it as they made their way to America. So they wrapped it in a blanket and they told nosy fellow travelers it was a mirror. This earned them much mockery and derision. How vain those padiatis are. Here we are fleeing for our lives, bringing only what we can carry, leaving everything else behind, and they care so much about their precious good looks. What gets hidden? What goes into hiding when people immigrate to the United States? For us, it was an inconvenient syllable in a long Greek name, in a culture that favors names like Smith and Brown. It was my papu's age and status as a child, and in a broader sense, his youth itself. It was an old Greek Orthodox icon, later to shine forth with all its somber beauty, but battered by the years and miles. It was also, I learned to my shock when I was about 30, my parents' legal marriage at a New York City courthouse six months before the wedding at St. George's in Philadelphia. Evidently, my father's visa was running out and US immigration law based then on national origins quotas that were skewed toward Northern Europe and Britain made it tough for Greeks to become permanent residents. The Mexican people who I interviewed in Pasco, Washington shared their own stories of things being hidden and going into hiding, coming to America. The theme resonated with us, but the details were significantly different. There was, uh, in terms of things that were hidden, there was the money to pay for a family's cross-border passage that one mother sewed into the hem of her skirt to conceal it from the coyotes, that's the smugglers who brought them over. There was precious food and water revealed and shared when families were cooped up in way stations with only dirty water out of a hose to drink and no idea which side of the border they were even on. Mostly the stories I heard were of people having to hide themselves from fearsome danger and often showing great courage and generosity. So one young father, uh, Pedro Ruiz, told me how he and a fellow traveler had made it across the border in the trunk of a car after they left their home villages and their family goats in Mexico. The air was tight, the heat was intense, the road was rough and the car was racing along and the other man started to panic. Pedro kept his nerve and gently calmed the other fellow saying, you're gonna make it, this is so you can make it. Ramona Diaz was a young mother whom I often saw with her children and her husband at the union meetings where she took an active role. She told us that when she first arrived in the US from Mexico, she lived la vida encerrada. That means you lived your daily life pinned in like an animal. You went out to work, but otherwise you tried to stay invisible. What she said reminded me of another story that I heard from Elvira Mendez about hiding in a big crate of apples one day when immigration officials raided the packing house for apples in central Washington where she was working. These women too showed startling courage amid adverse circumstances. So Ramona told us how the sun beat down on her when she worked out in the fields before she'd gotten her job at IVP. And yet she said she felt free, that was her word, doing the work outside, moving about in the open air, working at her own pace without being watched all the time and pushed by a supervisor like at the, at the meat factory. That sense of freedom stayed with her later and helped her gain the courage to encourage other workers to stand up for themselves against the abusive treatment that many of them got at Tyson. 
she was pretty amazing. And she did this despite the company's threats um, and despite fellow workers' doubts and cynicism and despite how exhausting it was to tend to her kids while also working and being an activist. I really admired Elvira Mendez too and her clever resourcefulness. So she was spent about two hours in the apple crate, but eventually she climbed out and she tossed her telltale, oh, someone needs to uh, mute there. There we go. She climbed out of the apple crate. She tossed her farm worker's hat that would be a dead giveaway into some bushes. She grabbed some lipstick and put it on and she strolled confidently out of the facility, head held high. She was hiding in plain view, you might say, but also in this act of slightly disingenuous self-assertion, confirming her own sense for herself that she had a right to be there. Pedro had acted likewise when the INS raided a warehouse where he was working near Los Angeles. Um, when the agent showed up, a coworker froze in fear and started nervously coughing. Pedro patted the guy in the back, sent him to the bathroom, and then just stayed at his post working, doing his best to look like a person who had a job to do and didn't appreciate any interruptions. And the agents never questioned him. Although he said that day, they did take away about 40 people. So Pedro and Elvira, as you can see, were protecting themselves, hiding themselves, but also visibly asserting themselves by doing what cultural analysts call passing. And I see here more than a passing resemblance to the precocious teenager from Mitilini, who tells the border agents he's two years older than he really is and walks on into Boston, or who makes Roosevelt's convention ushers think it's obvious that of course the doctor should be escorted to his seat. Courage, bending the rules and mollifying their enforcers with dignity and pluck. Claiming the right to have rights, as political theorist Hannah Arendt puts it, precisely when the law and the state tell you those rights are not yours to claim. Those are parallels between the stories that Mexican people told me of their migrant past and the stories of my family. There are ways that we Greek Americans should see more than traces of the familiar in what immigrants from Mexico have lived, how they've protected themselves and advanced themselves. Now, what about the differences? Um, here in my study at home, which you get to see because we're on Zoom, <laughs> um, I have this poster hanging on the wall. It's the one back there. The slogan, courage is greater than fear, was invented by the National Day Labor Organizing Network. My most recent book, as Kosti said, was about day laborers. Um, they're another set of migrant workers in the United States who mainly come from Latin America. Like meat packers, Day laborers are central to the US economy, specifically residential construction and home improvement. So they're the ones who keep the gardens tidy and the houses sturdy. Tyson workers make sure that there's plenty of high protein food for the family table inside. I think the day laborers motto, courage is greater than fear, suggests how we might begin to understand what's really different to recall Maria Martinez's admonition about Greek and Mexican immigration experiences. To see the differences, you have to ask, what exactly is there to fear when you're an immigrant? And what kind of courage do you need to face down that fear? I mentioned that because of the war, it was very dangerous for my great grandparents in Greece when they fled after Papu had left on his own. And I'm sure that there were other perils on the ship across the ocean. That's why they kept that icon under wraps but they didn't face the threat of violence when they arrived. Greeks usually didn't encounter such threats, although they did face some pretty deep prejudices. Prejudices for not being from the right part of Europe or in some people's minds, not from Europe at all. Not having a modern enough culture or religion, too prone to take life easy in the blissful Mediterranean sun instead of working hard. With attitudes like that, it's no wonder so many pieces of the Parthenon are sitting down the street from me in the British Museum rather than in Athens. It's not just that the British think of themselves so highly, although believe me, they do. It's also because even today, they don't trust Greeks to think and act as enlightened people. But prejudice is different from violent hostility. I told you about the courage and generosity that Pedro Ruiz showed during that chaotic ride in the trunk of the car. 
I didn't, I didn't tell you that after he got out near the US-Mexico border, he was shot at as he ran through the hills. And the men wielding the guns were not US border patrol agents. They were armed vigilantes, private citizens who were taking the law into their own hands to keep Mexicans out of Arizona. Well, when that's what you have to fear, it takes a different kind of courage to keep going, keep hoping, keep working. Many more US private citizens near the border are armed with guns today than 30 years ago when Pedro crossed over. This is both new and it's another chapter in an ongoing story of anti-Mexican violence in the US Southwest. Now, we all know about America's shameful record of lynching black people during slavery, in the pushback against reconstruction, with the rise of the modern Klan, and in the days of Martin Luther King, with whom Archbishop Jacobos marched. But did you also know that lynching Mexicans was a common practice in the Southwestern US, especially Texas, in the 19th and early 20th century? I didn't know that until I started working on this book project. Not just a few, but thousands of Mexicans were lynched in these acts of hatred, um, and aggression, tortured, hanged, and killed. This was organized systemic violence, not just a few random acts. It involved cooperation between private groups and public law enforcement agencies, um, just as the lynching of African Americans did. Most Americans today think of the Texas Rangers, if they think of them at all, as a not very good baseball team in the American League West. But in the history of that region, the Texas Rangers were the government forces that specialized in lynching Mexicans and terrorizing Mexican communities. They were renowned and feared for their ruthlessness and brutality. Now, I don't know what would have happened to my papu if he had been turned away at the border in Boston. Maybe he would have faced a sorrowful and lonely ship passage back to Greece. Given his ingenuity and self-confidence, he very well might have found some other point of entry into America. But I do know that even though he broke the law when he lied about his age in 1914, he wouldn't have been locked up. He wouldn't have been branded a criminal just for not having legal immigration documents or having no documents at all. And he wouldn't have been told to wait for an immigration court to hear his case with no access to counsel and no trial date given. That was what Pedro Ruiz, Elvira Mendez, Ramona Diaz, and all their coworkers had to fear when they came to America. That and the legacy of the Texas Rangers. Well, I think it takes some kind of courage to confront those fears and that history. Now, some of you may be listening to what I've just been saying, shaking your heads and thinking something along these lines. Oops, not yet. <laughs> uh, you might be thinking, Things are really different for Mexican immigrants compared to Greek immigrants, not just because of threats against Mexicans, but because they pose threats to America, Greek Americans perhaps included. What choice do people in the Southwest have but to arm themselves, some people say, when the government isn't preventing vast numbers of violent criminals from coming into the country illegally? Don't we need those immigrant jails when these people are overrunning small towns from North Carolina to Washington state? And sure, it's sad, but don't we even need them for children, say, a 14-year-old boy who tries to come over by himself, because our schools simply can't handle so many more students. The logic goes, if these Mexican people have a lot to fear, it must be for good reason. I've learned through research and personal experience, however, that these newer immigrants from the south of America, rather than the south of Europe, have much to fear, not because they're inclined to crime and violence, and not because they're putting our children's education at risk. These were common excuses a century ago for the lethal violence of the Texas Rangers, but they were no truer then than they are today. In those days, Mexican people were lynched and stereotyped to keep Mexican workers and communities in their place. That meant doing stoop labor in the fields, especially after the abolition of black slavery made farm labor harder to get for American agribusiness. University scientists sadly helped keep people in their place. They testified to Congress in the 1920s that Mexicans were supposedly suited to such jobs by nature with bodies made for hard labor, minds ill-equipped for intellectual tasks and volatile temperaments needing firm discipline by their social betters. Well, my papu knew about hard physical labor too. 
from that tire factory in Boston and all those nights working at the restaurant. My yaya's mother knew about it even more. Now, her name was Anna Evangelides, and we called her Big Yaya, although she was barely five feet tall, as I remember her as an elderly woman. Now, Big Yaya worked for some 30 years, I was always told, in a Johnson & Johnson factory in New Brunswick, New Jersey. That's where Yaya's family had settled when they came from Asia Minor. In this picture here with Yaya, mom, and my Aunt Rhea, uh, that's Big Yaya on the far right, uh, and we named our daughter after her. Big Yaya lived with Yaya and Papu, and when I'd go over to the house in Drexel Hill, she was always a bundle of energy, always either upstairs sewing clothes on her machine in her room or vigorously stirring some pot in the kitchen. That is, unless Papu was in there curing his olives or stewing squid with red wine and peppercorns, the pungent aroma of which I remember today like it was yesterday. But one day when I was over there, Big Yaya was just tired. She was quietly sitting in the breakfast room and Yaya told me it was because her back was hurting her and her arthritis was acting up. All those years of working at Johnson & Johnson, Yaya said, had made Big Yaya's muscles and joints really stiff. So um, I offered to give Big Yaya a back rub, which I'd never done before. She'd always been the one patting me on the back and saying, my boy, my boy. She didn't say much else that I understood because she spoke very little English and I didn't speak Greek. I was utterly shocked by how knotted up her back muscles felt. They didn't feel like muscles at all, more like hard pieces of wood. I remember her face scrunching up as I tried in vain to get those muscles to soften. Some 20 years later, I'm sitting with Elvira Mendez at her kitchen table. She's telling me about how working in the beef processing factory at Tyson has affected her body. Meatpacking is America's most dangerous job, and Tyson's Pasco plant is in the worst quartile of America's meatpacking facilities for job-related injuries and health problems. That's as officially counted by the U.S. Occupational Safety and Health Administration, which we know understates the actual rate. Each year, one of every four workers at Tyson's Pasco plant gets so seriously injured or ill from their job that they have to miss work for at least a day. Among the most common injuries are muscular skeletal disorders that cause workers' muscles and joints to swell and sometimes just lock up. This happens from making repetitive motions, minute by minute, hour upon hour, every single day, cutting into half-frozen hunks of cattle carcass with no time to sharpen your knife when the blade gets dull, and doing all this at frantically high speeds. Elvira explains to me why she recently had to switch from her regular job to what Tyson calls light duty because of her muscular health problem. She holds up her arm, and I can see that it is swollen to twice the size of the other arm. I can tell just by looking how seized up the muscles are. A child comes running in, and Elvira gives the little boy a caress on the head. And then she tells me how because of her injury, she can't pick up her grandkids anymore, even the little ones. There's factory work that hardens your body, makes it tough, but also makes it hurt and binds it up, especially when you're 80 years old like Big Yaya. And then there's factory work that distorts and disfigures your body, work that makes the pain so bad your sense of normal pain changes forever and you can't even sleep. Work that physically erodes the ordinary ways that family members care for each other and express love for each other. My intuition is that we should see what it's like to tell these stories about immigrant women and their working bodies together. I'm sure you can sense the resonances. And also like Maria Martinez said, you can hear how these Greek and Mexican immigrant experiences are really different. Why do Tyson and all the other major meat companies run their production lines at speeds that injure workers? Why isn't manufacturing food products for our families being done in ways that are healthy for workers and their families? Well, it's because Americans just assume that cheap beef will be there whenever and wherever you want it, whether you're on Girard Avenue or on the main line or in 30th Street Station or anywhere else. Companies like Tyson, of course, earn large profits by fostering that assumption. And to sell the beef so cheap, Tyson and its competitors have to drive their employees to churn out massive volumes of product in very little time. Now, until I did my research with the Tyson workers, 
I never thought about what made it possible for fast food restaurants to feature the dollar menu, right? But 99 cents is not the real cost of that burger. The real cost also has to be measured by these immigrant workers' physical ill health and emotional loss. And similarly, I think we should ask, what's the true cost of the magical speed with which Amazon delivers anything we wanna buy right to our door, right? Or if having apples of all hues and varieties on display in any supermarket in America for under a dollar a pound, or in Britain for that matter. Powerful engines of our economy, our world economy, rely structurally on immigrant workforces and count on those workers to pay some very personal costs that rarely get measured. Why do immigrants pay that cost? Well, partly it's because they have things to fear that are worse than paying it. Things like indefinite detention in immigrant prisons or violence against Mexican communities. Now, about five years ago, my cousins and I um, were helping mom finally move out of our old house in Rosemont. There was a lot of stuff to sort through, and I mean a lot, uh, to sort, to box up, or to coax mom gently to give away. One day, to my surprise, I found a folder of articles that Papu had written for physicians' newsletters uh, and community groups on public health issues like smoking and mental health. You see, Papu had that spirit. That's part of why he founded, co-founded, the Hellenic University Club. Papu was a doctor who had deep compassion for his patients, and he held literally sacred his ethical responsibility as a physician. But he also cared passionately about public health, not just the well-being of individual patients, but also about encouraging healthful habits and institutions in society at large. So I think Papu would have been pretty disturbed to learn about the outbreaks of ill health and injury in so many core industries where the workers today are usually Latino immigrants. So like Nicholas Pattis, we should embrace our civic duty to promote a healthy society. That means asking, who pays the unseen cost of the food and furnishings in our homes and why today's immigrants have to pay that price? And we should ponder these questions because we come from immigrant families too. Our family members have known what it's like to do hard physical labor that hurts and changes your body, if not to the degree that is so common at Tyson. We Greek Americans are physically affectionate. How well I remember Papu lifting me onto his lap and Big Yaya fussing over me. We can understand the heartbreak of having to leave your grandchild sitting there on the floor when she holds out her arms to get picked up because you can't lift her anymore. Finally, our immigrant families have known what it is to take risks and make sacrifices out of hope for our children's educa uh, education and their future. Esperanza Soto was another individual who had worked at Tyson for many years. That's her uh, in the blue on the right standing up. In 20 years, her wages had barely risen at all. She suffered injuries to her hands and then wounds to her dignity when the supervisor wouldn't let her leave the line to go see the nurse. But she kept going in the conviction that through her sacrifices, her children would have better chances in life. More than anything, she wanted them to go to college. And she glowed, literally glowed with satisfaction because both of her kids had done so. Esperanza, the name means hope in Spanish, was typical of the many parents we interviewed. Their parental self-sacrifice wasn't just fatalistic self-denial. These individuals did want justice and dignity and um, respect for themselves. That's why they fought so hard to change conditions at the factory through the power of the union. But they also did that to show the younger generation how to stand up for themselves and how to inspire others with the courage to do the same. They wanted their kids to bring that schooling in power and politics, if you will, with them to the university. Not to forget that the struggle isn't just about one person climbing higher on their own. As Elvira Mendez put it, it's also about everyone doing their part to make things better for all. Courage over fear, an aspiration to Paidea as an animating ideal. You know, it's an ancient vision of education that means something other than professional training to gain upward mobility. More precisely, Paidea signifies a political education, 
learning how to live together wisely and well in a democratic society. Marie Martinez was right to say that it's been really different for Greek immigrants than immigrants from Mexico. But what I've learned is that by noticing the things that aren't so different, we can tap into vital sources of curiosity and fellow feeling. They can motivate us to ask why the differences are there and they can move us to explore what we can do about them when they're not just differences, but problems that implicate us because of past legacies and present circumstances alike. Thanks. <laughs> That's what I've got for today. Um, uh, we have time for questions, as Kosti said. I don't know if, if one of you is going to moderate or something, but Thank I'm you. happy to take questions about anything, whether it's about work or the, the family or your comments, um, if anything anybody wants to ask or say. Thank you so much. First of all, just I think just a huge hand of applause for, for this wonderful integrative talk. And, and absolutely, we, the, the floor is open to any questions from any direction. And uh, 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 I see a hand from Antonio. Yes, I just want to make a comment. Uh, in fact, I am the uh, co-chair of the uh, scholarships committee. And we give for many, many, many years the Padis scholarship. And I knew that he was a, a founder of the club, co-founder, as you said, but I never knew the story. So I know and I thank you. So thank you very much for that. Thank uh, you. Yeah, it's a real honor to get to share it with you. And one minor comment. I mean, the, you can make a lot of arguments where, whether the, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, experiences of, of the Mexican migrants were similar or different than the ones than the Greek uh, immigrants. But, uh, uh, you know, we have this uh, custom in Greece. So when somebody is getting uh, uh, killed in an accident, they go and build little churches on the side of the road, right? Yeah. And so when I was in California uh, on sabbatical, I saw little churches on the side of the road and they were actually built by Mexican immigrants, I mean, or, or descendants of immigrants where they're uh, people from their families were actually killed them. And I was really surprised by the similarity. So just a minor comment in, in, in the richness of the context that you provided. Thank you for that. That's really interesting. I've seen those too. Uh, and I'll keep my eye out for them because I'm doing this research right now in California, uh, what I can get there in this crazy situation. Thanks. Who else has a comment or a question or anything? Yeah, I see a hand from Tom Karras. Hi, Tom. I can't hear you, Tom. You're on mute. Can't hear you oh. still. There you are. OK, now I can speak. Um, <laughs> I mean, I mean, whereas, of course, we've spoken together, as I, I know your family very well. In fact, I know your whole story. Um, and I'll use this as an opportunity to make a brief comment that could lead us to later conversations of much greater depth. But I think it's important to recognize the fact that all of this comes from a history that extends well beyond America, through Europe and the rest of the world, back historically to times that were always very difficult. Mm -hmm. Difficult times are not new and in fact represent the human condition. It doesn't justify it, but it's important to recognize that it's not new. And it is a constant struggle that's been with us for thousands, not tens or hundreds, but thousands of years. Mm. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for that, Tom. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's really interesting. I actually teach a text in one of my seminars um, that is that, that is about the history of, of mass population movements, a kind of genealogy of deportation. And it talks about how there have been, you know, basically forced movements of populations for, for centuries and centuries. I mean, at the same time, I think it's also important to, to, to acknowledge the things that are new today. We have never had some of the, uh, the capability to make um, industrial labor processes as fast and as tightly monitored as we do today in the computer age. This is, this is new and it's, and it's because of new developments of technology. 
Um, I'm looking at this more carefully now with regard to warehouse workers in Amazon and Walmart uh, warehouses in Southern California, where people's body motions are regulated all the time by, by computers that, can, you know, digital technologies that can know where the person's hand is in space and how quickly it's moving and whether it's uh, being attached to this container or that box at any uh, particular time. And there are, uh, there's a whole other set of um, health problems and, and injuries that are associated with work that's done under those kinds of stressful uh, conditions. So, um, so I think it's interesting and it's important to look at, you know, both to remember as, as, as Tom said, you know, the, the long historical, uh, you know, uh, roots of many forms of, um, you know, mass population movements and, 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 and problems people suffer but also to keep our eye on what's, what's new, what's new on our landscape today. Who's got another uh, thought out there? Paul, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hi, Aunt Ria. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I was just thinking about uh, two stories that um, you know, my yaya and my father uh, told me. I asked my father one time, well, what did you actually do when you worked for Hood Rubber Company? And um, he said, well, one thing was I really got real muscular because I had to lift these tires and stack them. Lifting a, you know, a big tire for a truck or whatever it is and put it on another pile. And so I was really getting you know, muscular and I was proud of that. Um, on the other hand, it was hard work <laughs> and the day I quit Hood Rubber Company, they had gotten a machine that did that for them. Mm -hmm. And he said it was the day that I quit that, you know, this happened. Uh, and I thought, you know, wow, you know, it could have gone on to something else, but that was it. And also my yaya wrapped packages for Johnson & Johnson. And wow. she told me one day that you know, she had a supervisor right there and you were paid per package, hmm. not for time. Interesting. And, and, uh, and they would watch you. And then, so she had a nine to five job or whatever it is. And then she came home to work for, you know, her sister and her husband uh, had this sewing business. So the woman got very little sleep and, yeah. and was, you know, just always, always working. No, yeah. I just wanted to put that in. <laughs> Is it true that they bought, brought a sewing machine from Greece with them? You know, I don't know, but I, I do know that they had one of the first models of the Singer, the Singer hmm. showing, sewing machine, which was tread. And, that, and she used it until she died. She never used the electric one. Wow. Thanks, Maria. Yeah. Um, uh, my, my cousin Chris is here and has a question. I just want. Oops, sorry. I'm sorry. Oh. Can you hear me? Okay. Is that anyway, Sophie? I, that uh, go go ahead. Someone else. Go ahead. I'll let, let me wait. I was just going to say. Wait. Oh, wait a minute. Did you? Yeah, we can hear you. I was just going to say that was a beautiful presentation. That was a beautiful presentation with all the photographs and everything. It was just wonderful. I'm sure your mother would be just as thrilled. I mean, so pleased. And also your grandfather, who was the very first doctor that my husband uh, years and years ago, my late husband. Um, that's the first doctor that I met when I came when I came here anyway in this to this area. And um, your mother would have been very proud of you. And it was a beautiful presentation. I'm glad that you're recording it so that other people can see it too that didn't have an opportunity today. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. That means a lot what you said. I really appreciate it. A dear friend of your mother's, your mother and I were in a Bible study together until just before she passed away. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah, that meant an awful lot to yes, her. Yes, sir. Did. Yeah. Yeah, wonderful. Thanks, Sophia. Um, Chris, you, you had a you had a question yeah, there. I, I did. Uh, thank you. That really that that was very moving. I, I had a 
Um, I pol- I, this is actually somewhat more abstract question, so I'll, I'll apologize in advance. But one of the questions I had related to you, you were very careful um, about drawing analogies between the Mexican experience and the Greek experience and, and mm-hmm. weighing that and, and, and you're and, and hesitant about, about those kind of equations. But it, but it felt like another part of that hesitation came from questions about whether identification at all is the right way to proceed as a, as a kind of grounds of political um, consideration. And, and I wonder how you, how you feel about that. Um, I mean, given, you know, it's a very moving talk and, and how you, and, and particularly in relation to a population that is um, in, intent on avoiding the gaze in various ways of, of the, the, the um, you're talking about hiding or hiding in plain sight. And, yeah. and it mm-hmm. seems like that raises that larger question about identification as a, as a motivator or, so that was, that was my question. Yeah, that's a good question, Chris. Um, you know, I, uh, and I, uh, as I was writing the talk, I was, you, you know, as you do when you're writing, you kind of, sort of like run through the words you're going to use in your mind. It's like, do I want to say identify? Do I want to use, I thought of using the word empathy, but I didn't want that to sound condescending. Um, you know, but I, uh, so I, you know, identify, I put that early in the talk as, and, and use that basically to, to, to talk about the disposition that I was now questioning. Because I don't think really identification, that's too strong. But what I do think that, I, I do think that it's really important to take seriously the resonances. Um, you know, I'm going to move to language that's a little bit more vague, but, but intentionally, you know, the, the resonances, the, the things that feel very similar, acknowledge those, and then have those become a, you know, a spur to, to, to then examine the differences. Uh, it, this, there can be too much of a tendency, I think, in public culture to either say that things are exactly the same or that they're just entirely, entirely different. And um, and, and and I think that what we what we're after is is subtlety. Uh, you know that, that 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 we need more subtlety in public discourse, and we need more, um, you know, people who are also willing to look at their own history, immigrants who are willing to look at their own history, the painful parts as well as the parts. That you know you want to celebrate, you know I could take Papu's story and just turn it into, you know a kind of stereotypical American dream story. He like, came and he worked so hard and he became a doctor and isn't that isn't that glorious? But it wasn't all glorious, and um, and so and and how do you have any sort of common you know common understanding of what people go through today if you don't acknowledge what's what what's in our own past too, you know. The, the heroic things, as well as, you know, the other things that are more complicated. And then um, my neighbor, Zena, uh, two doors down here in London, is, is, is here with us, as well as our dear friend, Phil, who lives downstairs. <laughs> Welcome to you both. Um, Zena has her hand up. Zena, what's your yes. question? Uh, it, it actually isn't a question. It's, it's more of an observation because there's a knock-on effect which you may not be aware of because you didn't, you weren't here at the time. But in the 90s, and I'm not sure whether it was the mid or the late 90s, two young people were um, handing out leaflets outside McDonald's, I think probably in Leicester Square or somewhere, trying to persuade people not to eat McDonald's at all because they said, first of all, the food was poisonous because the animals were reared so badly, but also that it was more or less slave labor that was working in those factories, those Mm. meat processing factories, Mm. and that um, the people who worked in McDonald's making flipping burgers were working for very, very fast and for very low wages. And altogether, people should not um, eat McDonald's at all and should boycott it. And McDonald's took them to court and sued them. Now, you can imagine these two young people who actually hadn't known each other before had absolutely no money at all. And in law in this country, you don't get legal aid for a libel case. Hmm. And so they were completely sort of flabbergasted. They didn't know what to do. And they decided they would have to try and defend themselves. And what happened was that they were lucky enough to come across a lawyer, young lawyer, who was prepared to give them every evening pro bono advice and to talk them through 
what they should do each day in court and advise them what how to proceed. Hmm. And in the end, it went to the European court where they could be represented. And it was the same lawyer who represented them and they won. That lawyer, by the way, was called Keir Starmer, if that's of <laughs> interest to you. Um, but um, they, the result was that McDonald's here no longer um, uses meat from America. Oh, that's interesting. That's really interesting. Yeah, I mean, the complexities of the, of the global market are just, um, it's kind of staggering uh, to contemplate. And then the, 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 there is that issue too that people sometimes struggle with. So if you know that, that there are, you know, real negative, you know, consequences of labor processes for people who work in a certain industry, then is boycotting the right thing to do? Um, or, you know, is there some other way to engage because people want to keep their jobs, of course. And uh, it, it also reminded me of something interesting. And one of the things that we, one of the things I didn't talk about in the, in the talk, but that is a theme in my book, Breaks in the Chain, is that there's another sort of you know, connectivity between the, the circumstances of work for these Latino meatpacking workers and other people in society more, more broadly, which is between workers and consumers because the same uh, labor process, the same production standards that go, make the production go so fast and make it so dangerous for the workers also increase food contamination risks for consumers. And that's why we've seen these periodic big meat recalls. Um, several of them happened just in the time that I was writing the book, um, you know, 15, 15 years ago or so. And uh, it's and then the workers tell you why that is, because when things are going so fast, then, and, and, and the supervisors know that they have to go so fast, they look the other way when the piece of meat drops on the floor or doesn't look quite so fresh. On the, on the on the rack. And so as a result, the workers told us that they generally didn't eat their own hamburger uh, that they produced in the, in the plant because the hamburger multiplied the dangers because you had so many different pieces from literally hundreds of different cows end up in the same pack of, of ground beef. Whereas you were safer with like a steak or you know a single cut of beef. So beware, I'll, I'll <laughs> I'm not a big fan of like the new vegan craze. I love, um, uh, uh, meat still, but uh, apologies to those who are vegetarian. But uh, <laughs> but if you if you do enjoy meat, be careful. <laughs> uh, I saw another hand from Antonio and Costis. Antonio, you're still muted. Yeah, uh, the, 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 the the eternal mistake of Zoom. So. Uh, I wanted to make a comment, a follow up on what you said. Uh, you, you almost uh, uh, wondered yourself whether uh, boycotting is, is really the, the right uh, way to go. Uh, and, and the comment has to do with the fact that, of course, these things can be automated, but there is a tremendous capital cost. And at this point, the, the owners of, of that business and many other businesses are making a pure money decision that says, that the low salaries of the workers uh, make that choice more attractive financially than the automation. So, you know, if the boycotting essentially uh, sort of pushes for higher uh, uh, wages, it sort of tilts the equation towards automation. So, you know, you may think that you're doing the right thing, but at the end, you may be pushing these people out of, of job uh, uh, right. with a, a, a sort of a weird, uh, you know, result. Yeah. I, I, definitely not in the minds of people that they are asking for this kind of access. Right, yeah, you have to be aware of unintended consequences in those, in those ways. Um, it is interesting, I mean, um, I didn't, uh, I mean, it's important to understand that the meat pet, the part of the reason why production can go so rapidly especially in American plants, which, which American meatpacking plants have the highest um, rates per hour of, um, of creating products in the world, much higher than Europe, for example. Part of the reason is because the industry has been highly automated um, for decades, um, going back to the early 20th century, but then it really, really sped up in the 1960s. And now it's becoming even more complex and more just-in-time kind of production because of the ability of, of um, 
you know, digital technology to, to, to keep track of stock declines, you know, not, not stock as in financial, but like stocking shelves with meat in, in, in large stores and um, to send that information to the factory quickly so that people can, can you know, redistribute their efforts. But, um, but it is, I mean, automation is a big part of the problem. The thing is that they could, there, there are safer kinds of equipment. There are sort of, there are changes that the companies could make to make their workplaces more ergonomically um, functional for workers. Um, one thing in particular workers often talked about was always having to stand in a very awkward position as they were trying to, you know, grab the piece of meat that was brought to their workstation by this giant me mechanical chain that hovered overhead. So if you brought the chain lower <laughs> and they wouldn't have to reach and, you know, stress their muscles, but that's very expensive. Um, so it's, it's these kinds of issues where, where the rubber really hits the road. Costis. Yeah, there we go. I just want to make a, a suggestion about sort of uh, uh, bridging that gap, the gap between uh, thinking about the contemporary uh, migrants that are uh, occupied in farm labor versus uh, our past where we as Greeks were, you know, small business owners and entrepreneurs. And to say that we've been, we've done a bit of an injustice from the point of, as historians of the modern Greek um, diaspora experience in really highlighting that one narrative of this, of the, um, uh, of the confectioner, the, the uh, you know, the restaurant owner, um, and beginning to really interrogate all the other stories that were parallel to that one model. Um, and I just want to highlight that there were actually a lot of, lot of Greeks that were involved in farming uh, that have been pushed out of the historical narrative. And I'll give just maybe three examples. One is uh, some really wonderful work uh, that's taking place now from the uh, uh, Tsakopoulos Center in Sacramento to see just how many Greeks were involved in the agricultural industry in, um, um, you know, in the uh, California uh, Central Valley. And also we have right here in our backyard, we have, you know, the Garden State, New Jersey, uh, and where it was very common for many of the uh, large farms, even um, one very well known one, Seabrook Farms, to really rely on seasonal uh, migrant workers that would come from Philadelphia uh, mm -hmm. and work for the summer months. Um, but because those, uh, and, and of course we have the, um, you know, the, the, the Tsakones, the, the villages from the, the Peloponnesian villages from that from that one village that created this incredible network of uh, food distribution from Hawaii to Florida to New York. I think if we, as historians, if we did a better job in uh, redirecting our attention to the the Greek, uh, break down the narrative that you know we were peasant agricultural people, right. we crossed the ocean and we became uh, middle class business uh, you know entrepreneurs. Whereas in fact, we crossed the ocean, we very intentionally avoided farm labor. And I think a lot of the contemporary viewers in the 1920s were saying, were puzzled by how come Italians and Greeks who have these great skills in farming stayed away from farming, you know, like the plague, mm -hmm. um, where in fact, we capitalized on our knowledge of agriculture in some way mm -hmm. to, uh, to move around it and, and, and not be directly the ones at the very bottom of the, of the pecking order. Um, and if you even think of the sort of the sequence from, um, being the you know uh, uh, carting um, the the produce to the streets uh, uh, of Chicago initially before settling into a brick and mortar store, uh, and then uh, really using agricultural know-how to, um, uh, to you know to 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 rise up in the same chain of production, however that we are trying to erase, um, and of course that immediately puts uh, uh, forces us to interrogate our. Uh, either, you know, the, our practices in restaurant business in the 1960s and 70s, or mm -hmm. even today, you know, what is the relationship between Greek restaurant owners and their predominantly Hispanic staff who have replaced their free wives and children, right, who used to be doing that same labor, mm -hmm. right? Um, the wives and children, the, the children have gone into college, so the Hispanic uh, laborers come in, and many of them, in fact, undocumented. So anyway, so it might be it might be a rock that we might not want to uh, to lift, but I think I think with the historical past, I think we just need to do a better job in saying yes, indeed, there were there were actually farm, yeah. Greek farm workers that were laboring in the fields. Thank you, that. That's really interesting, Kostis. I didn't know that about that project at the Tsokopolo Center, but that's that seems so worthwhile and and needed. And you're you're absolutely right. This connection between knowledge of farming 
and the restaurant business. And, and, and knowing, it reminds me of my cousin Miltos in Athens who works for a very nice hotel there. And his job is to choose all of the food products for the restaurant. And the, you know, the family still has its old farm on Limnos. He's on my father's side. And uh, the, the connections you know, of the kinds of knowledge that are needed uh, there. Also, the interesting thing where people assume that farm labor is you know, mindless, that you don't need to know anything. It's not intellectual work. Um, when in fact, you know, you, you interview people who have done farm labor and it turns out to be a lot more complicated than you thought, you thought it was and the kind of knowledge for knowing this, knowing the seasons, knowing the weather, knowing how to understand what is going on with a plant that you're, um, that you're working with. Uh, there's quite a lot of, uh, intellectual work that has to go on there. Um, I mean, the other thing that I think I would like to learn more about is the history of uh, Greek American involvement in unions. I know that in the railroad um, industry in the West, in Utah, for example, there were lots of Greek Americans that were whose whose work was crucial to building the Western portions of of um, of, of the the railroad lines. Um, but I don't know uh, much besides that uh, very general um, idea. No, absolutely. And that is actually, the, I mean, I think that, that that is another failure that is actually has made some great improvements in the last 10, probably 10 years in that the, the Greek American narrative is one of, of um, that has, you know, of the survivor, right, of the, of the yeah. entrepreneur who survived to endow the church, who kept the records, who, um, you know, who maintained the, the, the family connection. And, uh, but yeah, the, uh, many of you probably, I mean, the, the, the most iconic case of, uh, of labor unions is the, um, the, the Ludlow Massacre, which was a, um, uh, mm -hmm. a, a, union, um, a union protest against the Colorado coal fields, um, mm. where there were many Greeks working for the mines, and the, the leader of, that, of the union was, uh, uh, was a Greek from Crete, um, and he was actually killed when the uh, Rockefeller company who owned the mines brought in the, um, the, 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 the state troopers. So in Ludlow, uh, um, uh, I forget his name now, uh, uh, Stikas, Stikas uh, became a hero of the American labor union movement um, for, having for, have, for having been martyred. Um, so I think th there is a little bit more work about those proletariats, right? Those, those factory workers, right. those, those right. miners, those, those railroad workers who, um, who were probably just as numerous, but didn't leave a recognizable um, sort of footprint behind them, but were, had been there from the very beginning. Yeah, thanks right. for bringing that up, yeah. Mm. Luis Ticas, Luis Ticas, that's his ah, name. Yeah. Louis Ticas, yeah, a, a hero of the... Uh, American Labor Union. Th that massacre was the first public relations problem that the Rockefeller Company had. Oh, really? <laughs> so because they, they, there was a kind of a mass uprising. You now, how can you, you know, kill your employees? And um, yeah, to the, to the point where the, it's the beginning of also of, of establishing the Rockefellers established a kind of a, a public relations uh, strategy right. and, uh, and and almost like a, a business to anyway. Yeah. Stop. <laughs> Anyone else want to contribute anything? Hi, Paul. It's Georgia Hi. Kletches. Hi, Georgia. Hi. Nice I just, I, um, I just wanted. I'm, I'm in a location. I have to wear a mask when people walk in, so excuse me. But I just wanted to congratulate you on your talk um, and the program uh, today. Thank you very much. I found it very interesting and. Um, and uh, an honor to uh, your grandparents and your parents. And um, we appreciate it very much. It was interesting how you brought the past to the future and, and uh, gave us a lot to think about, things that we don't think about um, normally, but uh, definitely thought provoking. And I appreciate the program and wish you the best. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And thanks for being here. And there's my little niece, Vicky. Hi, Vicky. It's good to see you, honey. <laughs> well, um, what do you think, Costis? For some reason, my hand is still up. Let me lower my hand. <laughs> well, unless there's any other questions, I think we uh, should once again give a great hand of applause, Dr. Apostolides, and and. 
Um, <laughs> thank everyone for coming and um, uh, oh my goodness and all these wonderful people. I mean, this is probably the most extraordinary meeting that the Hellenic University <laughs> of has had because it shows in some way the power of this ability to bring uh, to bring people from California to from Greece, England, and yeah. you know family connections to professional connections, neighbors. So yeah. uh, this is a wonderful experiment. Thank you, Paul, for 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 speaking to all those audiences so eloquently as well. It is. Thank you so much. Thanks to all of my family who are here. It's 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 uh, wonderful to see you all, and to all who are not family here and who are old family friends. Uh, or not family friends. <laughs> um, great to see you as well. And thank you so much. And I look forward to more um, presentations on Zoom since uh, it's pretty easy to get to when you're in London and it's on Zoom. <laughs> Thanks for organizing this. Thank you, everyone. Um, have a wonderful uh, have a good evening day. or morning or afternoon. So we'll, we'll see you at our next talk in February. Great. Bye. Thanks. Bye.